Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. Welcome very, uh, welcome to you. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, today, uh, Pure Air is going to be continuing its monthly webinar series. My name is Kevin Jamison. I'm president at Pure Air Filtration. And uh, today we're going to be discussing odor control uh, systems, selecting odor control systems for wastewater. Uh, so this will be some of, of an introductory uh, to odor control technology. Uh, we do anticipate providing further webinars uh, in the future, diving deeper into the details of specific technologies for odor control in the wastewater industry. Uh, today, we're going to just be really covering uh, the broad subject of odor control and different options that you have uh, for this uh, application. So, um, if you have any questions during the during the uh, seminar, you're welcome to use the Q and A section or uh, send a chat uh, into um, using the, the feature in in Zoom. So take a look at your controls in Zoom and and either send a chat message or uh, put a question in the Q and A, and we'll take a look at those at the end. All right, so let's get started. So <clears throat> keep in mind. A number of things when you are considering odor control uh, for a wastewater application. Uh, the very first thing to understand is every application is very unique. Uh, very, very seldom do we ever have a time when a customer needs to order the exact same thing for the exact same application. Um, typically, air flows are different, odor levels are different, type of levels of, uh, are different. Uh, all sorts of different footprint requirements and such. So we find ourselves uh, working with a great deal of options and selections um, uh, when it comes to odor control. Um, also, I want to stress to you that total odor control needs to be looked at uh, rather than, uh, so for all odors, not just hydrogen sulfide. So uh, for the odor control industry, certainly hydrogen sulfide is the primary odor that we're concerned about, but it's not the only one. And I can tell you, it's probably not the, one of the worst smelling ones as well. Uh, it's the most common odor, um, but there are lots of other odors that have really terrible smells at very low levels. So it's very important that the technology that you look at doesn't just concentrate on hydrogen sulfide. It might focus on hydrogen sulfide, but it shouldn't ignore the other odors that are uh, involved in wastewater odor control. Also, allow for some flexibility in your design. Yes, having some engineering factor in there is very important, uh, um, but just know that when it comes to new constructions, it's, it's, of course, impossible to know exactly what the site conditions are going to be like. Really, to know exactly what odors and at what levels is not going to be very easy. So try to allow some flexibility in your selection and your design of the odor control system. Also, know that changes can occur on uh, down the road. Just because a lift station has a uh, certain odor signature at, some, at, at one time doesn't mean that in the future it might change as more and more uh, sources are, are applied or sources change in the wastewater um, stream. Um, also, obviously, it's very important to allow for access and operation of the system and maintenance. I can't stress more about maintenance. We see lots and lots of applications out there where an engineer's done a fantastic job in specifying and getting installed um, a great odor control system, but that odor control system uh, stops functioning uh, shortly after installation uh, simply because the maintenance required of it was beyond um, the ability or, or, or the uh, just desire of the, the uh, end client. So to keep in mind, maintenance is very, very critical for these. These systems typically operate 24 seven. And so you have, to, you have to allow for that and have to make sure that your client's ready for the maintenance involved in certain technologies. Some have a lot less maintenance than others do, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, and as I med, uh, mentioned, and this kind of falls into the same thing, understanding the abilities to maintain once in operation. Is your client really good at maintaining uh, uh, the system, uh, uh, you know, their typical systems, or are they the type of customer who wants to just turn it on and 
and walk away and not come back uh, again. So let's talk about odors because there's a lot to discuss uh, in the subject and um, we're not going to go able to go in a whole lot of depth, but we certainly want to understand what we're dealing with. So uh, there are just fresh sewer odors and those are that's usually just a fecal smell. Um, and um, that's one thing to deal with. Uh, typically fresh sewage odor uh, has not had time to go through any type of uh, bacterial action and so therefore no hydrogen sulfide has occurred. Um, so that's the first one to deal with. Typically we don't see a lot of fresh odor, fresh sewage odor. Typically we're, we're dealing with uh, wastewater or sewage which has been uh, in the process um, for a period of time and has developed some hydrogen sulfide. Of course, hydrogen sulfide, we've already started talking about that. That's the primary focus for odor control. Without a doubt, it is the majority of all the odor that you're going to be dealing with. Um, it is um, uh, well established on how to capture hydrogen sulfide. There aren't a whole lot of secrets to that. Um, but there are different technologies which uh, perform better than others for hydrogen sulfide. Um, so we need to understand. Mercaptans, lots of mercaptans. That's actually a reduced sulfur compound that fits into this family uh, uh, that we'll talk about afterwards. But mercaptans, um, uh, ethyl mercaptan, methyl mercaptans have a very, very, very low odor threshold. That means that you can smell them in the parts per trillion level. Um, mercaptans are the gases that are added to natural gas so that you can smell an, a, a natural gas leak. So you may, not, uh, you may not realize that, but natural gas actually doesn't have a uh, smell and mercaptans are added to natural gas so that you can smell it. So if you've ever smelled a natural gas leak, then you know what mercaptans smell like. Um, other reduced sulfur compounds, uh, 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 all of these gases, um, uh, uh, carbonyl sulfide, uh, dimethyl sulfide, dimethyl disulfide, all of these are typically gases which are produced um, are from, are related to hydrogen sulfide, but they're typically a, a sulfur organic compound um, and they have really, really terrible odor signatures. Uh, dimethyl disulfide, for instance, is the smell of putrid garlic. Um, these, these are typically compounds that are found at very, very low odors, and I can tell you are much more difficult to remove than hydrogen sulfide. Compared to hydrogen sulfide, these gases are typically found at lower levels, but have really, really awful smells. I'll mention to you ammonia and amines. Uh, that's also a, an aspect where you have to, to uh, remove these, but I'll say that ammonia can very often be ignored. Ammonia is a special uh, odor, and it can typically only be smelled at fairly high levels. Certainly in the PPD, I mean, in the PPM level, parts per million level, where uh, these gases, many of these gases can be smelled in the parts per trillion or maybe parts per billion level, certainly, uh, parts per billion. Ammonia are only really gonna smell that at the part per million level, and so typically, it's not necessary to focus a lot of uh, effort in the removal of ammonia odor. Also, there can be volatile organic compounds, typically from solvents or something to that degree that might be in the wastewater. So those are, that's just another odor that might be available for you to focus on. So just giving you an, an idea of some of these odors, we talked about hydrogen sulfide. It has that rotten egg smell. Uh, odor threshold for it is typically stated at three parts per billion. Mercaptans, I talked about, that is the gas that's in that, the odor that's in natural gas. Some of the descriptions are a skunky smell or a rotten cabbage, putrid garlic. These are in the part per trillion that you can smell these. Carbon disulfide, dimethyl sulfide. Indoles and scatols, amines, ammonia, hopefully you can use this in the future to help you identify uh, some of the odors. The key is none of these are good smells. Uh, generally, universally, uh, human beings do not like these odors 
And these odors can be smelled at very, very, very low levels. So it's very important that you understand that because the efficiency of your odor control system and your, the ability of your odor control system to remove or at least greatly reduce these odors is very, very important. So let's move on and talk about it. All right, so how do you determine what your odor is? At your uh, so if you have an existing lift station or pump station or a headworks or something and you want to understand what your odor is, what options do you have to work with? Well, fortunately, there are some readily available and reasonably affordable de devices um, for checking at least hydrogen sulfide. When it comes to the other gases, it gets a lot more complicated. But for hydrogen sulfide, there are a couple devices out. The Odalog has an excellent reputation for a long period of time. Um, this is a device which is uh, about the, the size of a, of a uh, soft drink can. Uh, and uh, it's a very simple operation, one touch on, one, one touch off. And this can be lowered down into a station, maybe a lift station or pump station. It can be lowered down uh, to just above the, the, the water line. Uh, and it will record uh, over time your hydrogen sulfide level. So this is a really a, a, a stalwart of the odor control industry, the Odalog. I'll mention to you though that uh, the company that builds Odalog has not really worried, worked on keeping this technology up to date. It's kind of been held back, uh, maybe for the you know the same in a decade. There's a new device which is very very similar to it called the Acrolog, and the Acrolog is very similar to it, but has some very very nice features, and it certainly have a, has a much better user interface and the ability to download the data as well. This is a Bluetooth device. It also has a cellular connection so that if you wanted to monitor it live, you can do that as well. It's an optional cellular connection I'll mention. So I'll certainly give a good plug for, the, for this Acrolog company. These have really just been out for a few years and it's, it's really a fantastic device. So when monitoring hydrogen sulfide, these are good devices. Um, I'll mention to you, there's also a device called a Drager tube, and this is an example of the Drager tube. This is a hand pump, and then you can squeeze the hand pump, and it's going to pull in air into this tube. And the tube has a chemical inside of it that changes uh, colors. You can select what gas that you want to test for. So you can test for hydrogen sulfide or mercaptans or something. And, and following the directions, you would pump a certain number of actuations of the pump through here and the amount of color change that occurs on this graduated glass cylinder would tell you what the concentration is. So this is a good device for taking a spot, a spot test to be able to um, understand what you have at that moment. It's not a logger like this is, uh, but it does give you a quick check test and it and there are uh, you know quite a number i think it ranges in the hundreds of, of gases that you can test for um with this so a drager tube can be helpful for for doing a spot check and seeing what's going on when it comes to measuring low levels especially um the 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 gold standard i'll say in in uh the odor control industry is the jerome gold film analyzer and they have a, a new model out this year this is what it's what it looks like this is a very expensive but very precise device that gets you down into the very low part per billion readings for hydrogen sulfide. It does have the ability to do some data logging and such uh, and it can be set up um, typically not as a permanent device but as for, for, for if you wanted to monitor a station for a week or so this can be set up to record a devices. Typically we use this device um, for short-term testing and to get some very low accurate readings. Typically, we're gonna be using this device to, for testing the outlet concentrations of our systems because those outlet concentrations are very, very low and we typically do wanna measure them. Um, these devices, um, depending on what selection you have, could either be a part per million level or a part per billion level. Um, uh, and so very, very often, the Jerome is used at, for monitoring uh, very low levels coming out of uh, odor control systems. 
Well, what about those other gases though? So we've talked about hydrogen sulfide. We talked a little bit about the Draeger tube and how we can test for, for other compounds. But if you don't know what compound to, you're, you have, it's not really easy to work with a Draeger tube because you have to select the proper tube for the gas that you're looking for. So what if you just wanted to take a sample of the air and, and have it tested? Well, this is uh, the technology is referred to as using a Tedlar bag. So these are, are basically a, a Mylar bag that you fill with the air. So you can use a pump to pump air into the Mylar bag. Um, and um, you fill this bag up. Typically, I'll just mention, don't fill up it all the way because you don't want the bag to pop, um, but, but fill the bag. Um, and it actually gets shipped to a laboratory and where they will do a spectral analysis and then they can identify the odors that are in there. So there are some ISO standards um, out there and there are some laboratories that specifically work in this area. You typically want to let them know, for instance, that you want to look for reduced sulfur compounds and they'll focus on reduced sulfur compounds or volatile organics or anything to that degree. You have to be very careful because you have to get the, this bag of air to the laboratory very quickly, typically about 24 hours so you have to do a lot of planning ahead of time to make sure that um, you are able to overnight this bag of air um, to a laboratory and uh, that they'll be ready for it when they receive it and they can do the test. So there's a lot of work involved with that. It is not a simple process to get that done, but this is a really good case, uh, a really good technology for being able to know exactly what your odor situation is. Um, you can also work with odor panels. So interestingly, this would use a similar bag of air, typically a bigger bag of air. And this big bag of air is brought to a special device. And there's actually a panel of people with trained noses who will actually uh, inject some of this air into the device. The device will dilute the air uh, and the, the, the panelists will will adjust the dilution of the air until they can no longer smell the gas which is being um, uh, brought out of the bag. So that dilution is referred to the dilutions to threshold measurement or odor units. So uh, a measurement of 100 odor units would mean that you had to dilute the odor by 100 times in order for the odor to disappear. So that's uh, a very common term that you might hear in the odor control in, uh, industry is odor units or dilutions to threshold. And that just means basically how much does that air have to be, the odorous air, how much does it have to be diluted until the odor goes away? And this panel can also give you some general descriptions of the odor as well to help you out with it. They won't be able to tell you exactly what the gas is, but they can give you some general indication. Well. The last instrument I'll mention to you is just the good old nose as well, all right? So the good old human nose is very, very sensitive. In fact, sometimes more sensitive than these devices. Um, the problem with the human nose is that every, everybody's nose is different. Some people's noses are very, very sensitive. Uh, some people's noses are actually not very sensitive at all. Even though I work for an odor control company, I don't have a very sensitive nose. And so you have to keep that in mind. But the, the human nose is a, a very good instrument to let you know if um, there are improvements in odor. Um, I'll also I'll just caution to you that there is something special in regard to hydrogen sulfide, that hydrogen sulfide, while it can be smelled at very low levels, when hydrogen sulfide gets to high levels, uh, actually towards dangerous levels, the, the smell actually goes away. It overwhelms your nose and your nose basically just shuts down and doesn't record the smell of hydrogen sulfide. So uh, I'll just note that for you when you're doing your work. Uh, if you run into a situation where uh, hydrogen sulfide odor disappears uh, on you, note that it might not be that the odor, that the hydrogen sulfide is gone. It just might be that the level is so high that you can't smell it. And I'll, I'll give you the warning that if it is that high, then you should probably seek uh, safety because that could be a hazardous area. So just taking a look at summary of odor characteristics, there are lots of different types of odors and the level and mix is constantly changing. So you need to understand that and, and uh, make sure that 
the system, the, the technology that you select allows for that. Um, offensive malodors, uh, detection is extremely low in the part per billion and part per trillion level. So these are, these are extremely low levels. Um, and you just need to keep that in mind because efficiencies for removal efficiencies to get your odor to the part per billion or even part per trillion level are really, really important if you want to have uh, you know, excellent odor control. Different odors need different types of treatment. So the big thing that I'll mention to you here is not every odor can be removed by every technology. Um, so we just need to understand that the, 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 the benefits and limitations of different technology. And that's one of the items that we'll be talking about coming ahead. Um, so really we stress system design needs to be effective for all, all odors which can be present. Don't focus just on hydrogen sulfide. Very important. We see this a lot in specifications where it's the specification for a project is really just hydrogen sulfide removal or hydrogen sulfide reduction. And we've seen plenty of cases where uh, the, the engineer or the client who specified the system got exactly what they specified and there was still a lot of odor because they specified a system to reduce hydrogen sulfide and didn't want to address the other issues, the other odors that could be present. So we'll just mention that to you. It's really easy uh, to, to address those items, but uh, you, a little bit of planning up front is important for that. So we're gonna talk about odor control technologies today. Now, we're going to not spend we're not going to go into a lot of detail on how to size all these systems and go into detail. We'll probably have another um, session uh, coming up to talk about each of these individually, um, but we will talk about these today so that you understand them if you're new to the technology or just are looking for an update on what's going on. Um, uh, we'll we'll uh, speak about that today. So. We're going to talk about adsorbent systems. This is very often referred to as activated carbon systems. This is the technology that was started with activated carbon, but it has advanced beyond that to lots of different adsorbents with different different characteristics and such. Um, and uh, we'll we'll discuss that in pretty good detail. We'll also discuss biological uh, odor control. This is um, well, let's call it a newer technology. It's certainly not a new technology but certainly over the past couple of decades, this technology has developed and, and really been fine-tuned and lots of great creative um, applications uh, of, of biological odor control have come about, uh, but it certainly has its limitations as well, just like any technology, and so we'll discuss those. We'll also very briefly discuss chemical scrubbers. I, I have to be quite frank with you, I'm not an expert on chemical scrubbers. Um, I know what they do, um, I'll be able to give you the information that I have, but as far as sizing chemical scrubbers and, and, and such, there's probably not a lot of detail. Um, uh, so we probably are going to, we're going to be spending the least amount of money on, I mean, sorry, the least amount of time on chemical scrubbers uh, today. So all of these technologies that will have one thing in common is they all need some kind of actual physical or chemical contact to remove malodors. Um, that's the mechanism that's, that, that separates these different technologies. So somehow, these, all, all of these technologies, these three technologies we're talking about, we have to be able to capture the odor and then bring it into the system. And then that odor has to have some kind of contact inside for a chemical reaction or in, uh, a physiochemical reaction to occur. Um, and so it's just the, the mechanism of how that uh, reaction occurs is the difference in technology. So when we're looking at technology, we're, uh, we, we're very interested in the efficiency of the system. There's lots of great high efficiency systems these days. Reliability, I mentioned that earlier, very, very important, especially in regard to the amount of maintenance that's required. The initial capital cost, of course, everybody's very interested in that. Operating costs really needs to be understood because we find a lot of 
customers don't understand the operating cost of a system um, and don't take that into account and run into budget problems later on. Of course, footprint and space is very important, um, uh, especially because odor control is typically in urban areas. Urban areas typically don't have a lot of space to, to give up. Uh, and so footprint can be very often very important. Um, ancillary buildings, systems and controls, just what else do you need uh, for the system? For instance, if you had a chemical scrubber, you have to have storage of the chemical that's going to be fed into the system. So where is that going to be? Uh, <coughs> uh, that my continued plug in regard to maintenance and operation concerns really need to focus on that to make sure it's a successful um, installation. Hazardous chemical handling, very important to understand the technology you choose and what chemicals it will have, if any, uh, and, and what are those hazards working with us? Of course, that's a big factor all around the world is we continue to focus on safe work practices. Aesthetics, very important sometimes, and we run into a lot of cases where the client is very interested in hiding the odor control system as much as possible. And so they often want us to provide a low system, which can be hidden behind a wall maybe, or something to that extent, something that doesn't tower up high. So aesthetics can very often be the case. Um, and then noise. All of these systems typically have to have some kind of a fan or a blower or, uh, with the system. And so we need to understand the noise of the system, what's required. Um, is, if this is going to be a, certainly there are going to be people in close proximity to it. Are they going to be able to hear the system? And if they can hear it, is it going to bother them as well? I'll, I'll put this in. This is a this is a selection chart that I came across. Um, looks like it got cut. A little message got cut down here. But this is um, a selection chart talking about at various uh, hydrogen sulfide levels. Now this is just for hydrogen sulfide um, uh, and at dis different airflows in both um, uh, met, uh, metric and imperial terms. These are uh, some suggestions to take a look at for odor control technology. So typically, uh, when you're dealing with low levels of odors and typically low uh, um, air flows, activated carbon might work as well as engineered adsorbents. We're going to talk more about engineered adsorbents. When you get into the up to kind of maybe 20 ppm and uh, a range of air flows, engineers, engineered adsorbents work well. Um, scavengers uh, are products which uh, can be used in conjunction with engineered adsorbents when you reach into some higher H2S levels. Um, biofilters and bio uh, scrubbers are typically uh, used in these levels where you've got a higher level of hydrogen sulfide. So I'll mention this chart didn't specifically Bring up chemical scrubbers. This is a little note that cut off, got cut off down here when we pasted this into the pres presentation. So chemical scrubbers doesn't, doesn't show up on this particular um, suggestion um, uh, solution. So you can take this with a grain of salt. This is something that was published and um, uh, is, is one, one author's opinion on, on selection for that. Um, so Let's talk first about the first technology, adsorbent technology, all right? So adsorbent technology is uh, generally, people would categorize that into activated carbon systems. So the, so the basis um, of the technology comes out of activated carbon. Activated carbon, we'll talk about in just a minute, is really good for general odor control. Typically, it has a low capacity for inorganic odors it allows for desorption of odors, um, and there's no way to measure remaining life. We're going to also talk about engineered adsorbent and show you some of those. These are uh, based on activated carbon type technology, but with some modifications to them to target particular gases or have particular function to it. And then the last area in that previous slide, it mentioned scavengers. We're going to take, take a look at what are these scavengers? How are they different than activated carbon? Um, uh, there really are kind of a an engineered adsorbent, but but they're a low cost uh, product. 
um, that, that can help in, in applications where you have high H2S and, and need to reduce that. So let's, let's take a look at uh, some of these. Um, so adsorption uses adsorbents. Okay, adsorbents are very, very porous products. And these, these have uh, these tiny pores that are in the adsorbent are just a little bit larger than the actual molecules that they capture. So adsorbents allow gases to go into them or they're captured in these little, little uh, pores there. These molecules of odor find their way into the pores and they're trapped inside and a weak molecular attraction holds these molecules into the adsorbent. Well, let's see, I think we've got something coming up about that. So, all right, so adsorption, and remember this is with a D, adsorption. Absorption is slightly different. They're both related, but these are two different words, absorption with a B and adsorption. Um, adsorption is the process where gases go into something and they're bound to the inside. So activated carbon is really a great adsorbent where gases go into the activated carbon and then they're, they're held in there by a weak molecular bond. So that weak molecular bond um, is almost like a magnetic bond, let's call it like that. So these, these particles are kind of like um, iron filings and they go into um, this, uh, which is like a magnet that's activated carbon and, and they're in there. But those, the, but those molecules can come back out. Probably a better analogy is what like we see here is like a sponge. So activated carbon is very much like a sponge. So if you had water on a, on a table and that represented the odor that you wanted to capture, if you put a dry sponge into the water, um, that water will go up into the activated carbon, right? So it, that act, activated carbon adsorbs get the odor just like a sponge adsorbs water. The, the difficulty with adsorption is a process called desorption. It's just the opposite of adsorption. Just as those gases can go into activated carbon, they can also um, come back out. So just like you can take a sponge and absorb that water I talked about, you can also squeeze that sponge and the odors come back out, all right? So that's a, 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 an issue that you have to deal with with activated carbon. While odors go in, sometimes the odors can come back out. So you have to be aware of that and make sure you understand it. So a subset of adsorption is called chemisorption. Chemisorption is simply an additional process where the adsorbent has a chemical added to it. This is simulated here in this uh, view. And then when the gases go into the inside, there's actually a chemical reaction that occurs, and that chemical reaction bonds these gases to the inside and actually converts them to a solid. So they can no longer come out. And so chemisorbents, chemisorbents are really, really um, effective in capturing odors and keeping them there and not letting them out. Um, the key is the chemical which is used in the chemisorption process is typically going to be very specific to certain families of, of odors. And so you, uh, depending on what chemical you use in your adsorbent, it's typically going to focus on certain uh, uh, capturing of certain types of odors. So no one chemisorbent is going to capture every odor. Activated carbon generally catches most odors, okay? It just doesn't have a very high capacity for uh, many of them. It actually has a high capacity for volatile organic compounds like solvents, but we don't see those type odors very often in the odor in the municipal odor control industry. And so uh, that's why activated carbon isn't typically a great product for uh, wastewater odor control is because uh, it doesn't have a high capacity for the gases that we want to remove and it allows some of those to escape. So that's chemisorption, just in a uh, in very brief description. So chemisorption is how we can take products like activated carbon and modify them by adding a chemical to them to permanently capture particular odors. So 
I'll give you a, I'll give you a view here, show you this view of what activated carbon looks like under an atomic microscope. So these very, very tiny pores are, um, are, are they're larger than molecules for sure, but keep in mind that you know we're dealing with individual capturing of individual molecules. So molecules will travel and they will travel down these pores and go into the activated carbon and they will actually bond and stick to uh, the side of this activated carbon. Because carbon has a strong van der Waals effect, you might recall from your, uh, your basic chemistry, this van der Waals effect sticks these gases to the walls of um, the activated carbon, especially if those gases have other carbon molecules. They have a strong bond here. So just to give you an idea of the amount of porosity that is in activated carbon, if you measured the area, uh, the surface area of every one of these pores and every in one gram of activated carbon, that total surface area would be about 1,100 square meters. That's about the area of a football pitch, all right? So you were talking about one gram of activated carbon can have the entire area of a playing field. It's really just an amazing amount of surface area, and that's because of the great porosity of activated carbon. So we use that in the industry to focus on how to capture odors. So adsorption is actually a physical process. I, I mentioned that somewhat magnetic process where gases go in and they bond to the activated carbon, but they can come right back out. So there's not really a chemical reaction occurring there. It's a physical capturing of odors. Chemisorption is that physical capturing as well as the, the chemical reaction. Typically some of the chemicals uh, that we work with are in these in these options or uh, in the chemisorption process or permanganates or caustic uh, uh, or there are some catalytic products available. We'll talk about that very briefly that um, are uh, go beyond just chemical reaction actually have some catalytic uh, properties to them. And just keep in mind that these are generally not reversible. So once the reaction occurs, it's um, it's complete and doesn't uh, you don't get a return of the gas that you were capturing. So activated carbon, a little bit more about that. So what is activated carbon? A lot of people hear about this activated carbon, they don't quite understand what it is. Well, very often people will refer to it as charcoal. And generally it is charcoal, but it's gone through an additional step where it has been activated, where all those pores have been opened up. All right, and so when those pores are all opened up, then it be, allows the gases to go to the inside. So it, activated carbon is charcoal, which has gone through an activated step. It's typically pure carbon molecules, or let's call it 95%. There's a little bit of impurities in activated carbon, but it's about 95% of the molecule C. It's just pure uh, carbon molecules. Um, carbon has this high molecular attraction I mentioned to you before. It's really, really great for volatile organic compounds. Um, it generally has very, doesn't have very high capacity for hydrogen sulfide. So that's the disappointment with our industry is it can capture many different odors, but hydrogen sulfide is not a great one for it to capture. It can certainly capture some. Um, it can release it because of off-gassing and uh, the, the unfortunate part with activated carbon is there's no reliable way to know when it's full. So how do, how do we know when to change out the activated carbon? When is it full of odor? There's not a really a great reliable way for that. And I'll just mention to you, activated carbon comes from lots of different sources. So here's coconuts. This coconut shell is actually can be uh, used to produce activated carbon. And it's actually one of the better activated carbons, especially for volatile organic compounds. So you'll very often hear about coconut shell activated carbon. Uh, that's really to, for VOC capture more than anything, but also coal is used. Uh, there's different types of coal that can be used for different properties for activated carbon. Nut shells, all sorts of different um, products can be used as the basis for making activated carbon. 
So here's that view of those pores, just to give you a little kind of a, a analogy on how these work. So pores have different sizes, keep in mind. So you start with large pores, and as you go down these channels into the activated carbon, you get smaller and smaller pores. So keep in mind that large molecules get stuck in large pores, and small molecules travel down and get caught in small pores. So different types of activated carbon have different amounts of porosities and different sizes of, of pores as well. So the activating process opens these pores up, but depending on what you started with, you might have larger pores. These are called macro pores, and you might have small pores, micro pores, okay? Typically, typically, Coconut shell activated carbon has a lot of micro pores, and that's very, very good for capturing those solvents. Other types of carbons have more macro pores. Macro pores are best used for the chemisorbents because it allows the chemical to get inside and to bond to the walls inside and, and uh, allows room for those gases once the chemical gets into the activated carbon. So keep in mind different carbons. Um, have different properties, and, and selecting that, that type of carbon can be important depending on the application you're trying to work with. Coconut shell activated carbon for VOC, volatile organic compound, typically is great because of these micropores. Typically, you want to be looking for macropores when it comes to using um, uh, products which will be uh, chemi become chemisorbents. All right. Um, um, so let's talk about carbon regeneration. So that's generally a subject that, that gets um, brought up in regard to activated carbon. So if you have activated carbon and you use it in an odor control system, the customer wants to know if it can be reused. So if it is plain activated carbon without any chemical added to it, the answer typically is yes. But it's typically not practical or effective to do that. It depends on where you're located in the world and what options you have. But there's two types of regeneration we'll discuss. Neither of them are very easy, all right? So the first is kiln desorption regeneration. So this means that you take your plain activated carbon and you return it to a processing site. You, this processing site takes used activated carbon and it runs it through a kiln and heats it up to drive off the absorbed gases that were in there. So just, I mentioned to you that activated carbon can desorb gases and this is an intentional um, desire, uh, you know, uh, uh, attempt to take all of those gases out by raising the heat in the activated carbon so high that all those gases, uh, all those molecules um, become so active that they leave the activated carbon. And then you return that activated carbon to use. Well, the issue there is that not all gases will be removed in, in the kiln. Great, certainly a great deal will maybe 90%, 80 to 90% will typically be removed. But this activated carbon, typically after it's regenerated, is considered less effective than the original activated carbon. So if you're going to be working with regenerated activated carbon, you have to, you have to expect that its performance will be less than what's referred to as virgin activated carbon. Virgin activated carbon means that it has not gone through a regeneration step. Yeah, so that is one way that you can. So if a customer has uses a great deal of activated carbon and they are in close proximity to a reactivation kiln, then this, this can work out, all right? But I can tell you very often, economically, it just works better for the customer to dispose of the old activated carbon, possibly use it in a, in a furnace and burn it, um, uh, to generate electricity or heat, um, and then to use new activated carbon. So regeneration of activated carbon just depends on where in the world you are, but typically regeneration of activated carbon is not real common. 
there is, there has been in the past a product which has been offered, uh, which allows for in situ water regeneration. All right, so this is a special carbon. And generally, the way that this works is that the activated carbon that is in uh, a, a, a carbon reaction vessel um, will be filled with water. This vessel will be filled with water and the hydrogen sulfide that was captured by the activated carbon will be converted to sulfuric acid and then that, that water can be drained out of the system and the sulfuric acid will be drained down into the sewer to be treated. All right, typically, um, this is, this is how it works in the laboratory. And in the laboratory, it works, works really, really well. In real life though, what ends up happening is this activated carbon captures more than just hydrogen sulfide. We're talking about way, all those odors that I was talking about before um, get caught in there and those do not wash out uh, during this washing process. Now, also keep in mind that you have to repeatedly wash this carbon. It certainly doesn't just take one soaking and draining for this H, the hydrogen sulfide to turn in sulfuric acid and wash out. And so the, the issue is typically, first you've got a lot of water consumption in certain areas of the world. Water, water is a premium and certainly using water just to wash activated carbon is not a greatly desired process. Um, the, product is typically highly diminished after its regeneration. So typically this product, even though in the laboratory, it shows that it can be regenerated repeatedly, in real life, because of those other gases that have been captured, th those, uh, this, this carbon diminishes its capacity probably by about 20% each time it's washed. So you start off with 100%, you wash it the, the very first cycle, it's used, then you only get 80% life, and then you wash it again, 20, uh, to, it reduces another 20% to 60%. And after a while, then you just have to replace it. So um, these other odors don't wash out. And keep in mind, the system is typically unavailable for days during the regeneration here. So when you're filling the vessel, then you have to let it sit for hours to allow the hydrogen, sulfur, hydrogen sulfide to convert to sulfuric acid. Then you have to drain it and then you have to fill it back up and then you have to drain it and then you until you until basically there's no more sulfuric acid which is available and then this um, um, and then you can return it back into into use now keep in mind all that activated carbon is soaking wet at that time and that's going to take days for it to dry out after you blow air through it so that whole system is basically unavailable for about a week while you're doing it so very often we see customers who put these systems in place and actually require a backup system to operate while the uh, primary system is regenerating. So generally this technology is faded from the market. We don't see it very much, but I did wanna cover regeneration because people ask about it. It certainly was an interesting technology, but it just didn't pan out uh, like uh, the manufacturers who were uh, promoting it thought it would. So, uh, we're going to talk more about um, beyond activated carbon, chemisorbents. So this is kind of adsorption plus. Chemisorbents is the result of a chemical reaction on the adsorbent. So in this case, the process is instantaneous and irreversible. The chemical, chemical oxidation or whatever reaction occurs converts the gases into some other solid. We've discussed that a few times here. Um, exhausted media can typically be converted men can be disposed of like at any ordinary waste. So while chemisorbents themselves might not be easily disposed of when they're new, typically when they go through their reaction, um, the reactants uh, of the gases that are captured and the, um, uh, the reacting um, chemical uh, are neutral and can typically be, be disposed of in, in most sanitary landfills. Here is an example of some uh, engineered adsorbents. So these chemisorbents, you can see here, lots of different colors and shapes and such. So, so there is two parts to a chemisorbent. There's the substrate, 
we've talked about activated carbon. Activated carbon is the king of substrates. It has the highest amount of porosity. It's the most versatile substrate, uh, um, but it certainly has its limitations. Alumina or aluminum oxide is basically a porous ceramic bead. That's really what you're seeing here. This is alumina. Zeolites are similar to aluminas. They have a little different uh, composition, typically some silica uh, rather than just uh, aluminum oxide. And then there are some porous clays that can be used as well too. So engineering um, adsorbents use these substrates. So that's the basis, that's the porous basis for the adsorbents. And then uh, there are various uh, chemicals that can be used to impregnate onto the substrate to go through that chemisorbent reaction. So caustics like potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide. Acids, if you're gonna take out ammonia, then you could use acids to react with, with uh, ammonia or, or amines. There are various oxidizers. This is one that we'll talk about here in just a second. Permanganates, which are very, very strong oxidizers are used very heavily in this industry um, for good broad range. And then the last is catalysts. Catalysts um, are really very, very effective for certain odor control, especially hydrogen sulfide. I'll mention, mention that we'll, we'll talk about uh, catalysts coming up uh, for a slide. Um, these are actually pretty amazing products to be able to have some really high capacities for certain odors. So, and actually that's what we're going to talk about here, engineered adsorbents. So uh, this catalyst um, referring to here uses an activated carbon base and it actually goes through this reaction where it's taking hydrogen sulfide and it's reacting with oxygen. There's actually requires some water in this, in this formula as a, uh, as a part of the catalytic reaction. It gets returned back to it. Um, it is a catalyst, so you would typically have this delta symbol over the re reaction occur. And in the end, you basically get elemental sulfur left over. And then, so this catalytic product takes hydrogen sulfide and turns it into elemental sulfur. And then there's a little bit of water that's generated uh, from it. These engineered adsorbents have a capacity of about 66, up to 66% by weight. Now, we talked about activated carbon being like a sponge before, but this is really like a sponge here, where this activated carbon can actually capture about 66% um, by weight, or this activated carbon-based engineered adsorbent can capture 66% by weight. So really amazing. Typical capacity for activated carbon would maybe be maybe 10% by weight for a really, really good activated carbon. So this really increases the ability to capture hydrogen sulfide. Now, the, now very often we have people ask, well, for in a, a catalytic product like this, why, if it's catalytic, why would it ever have to be replaced? Isn't that the definition of a catalyst? Is that the catalyst is always preserved in the reaction, it's never consumed in the reaction? And the answer is yes, but what ends up happening is all those pores inside of the substrate get filled with sulfur, and then no more hydrogen sulfide can get fit into those pores. So eventually, all those pores are filled up with elemental sulfur. The good news is elemental sulfur is not toxic. It's not hazardous. It's very easy to dispose of. Um, and so that element, this activated carbon is filled with elemental sulfur and therefore it can be disposed of easily, but it does eventually have to be replaced. So permanganate impregnating the lumina. So we talked about, about um, this in a couple of slides back. So this product is uh, referred to as PIA sometimes, or permanganate impregnated alumina. Uh, it is based uh, on an activated alumina substrate. So that's aluminum oxide substrate. It's basically a porous ceramic bead. It's impregnated with a permanganate. There are different types of permanganate, but the most common is potassium permanganate. And that gives it that bright purple color here. So that bright purple color um, is a strong oxidizer, potassium permanganate. Maybe you remember from your, from your chemistry days. And that 
that, how does it work? Well, it works on chemisorption and actually oxidation of these gases. So gases go into this adsorbent and they go through an oxidation reaction. So generally any gas that can be oxidized will be oxidized by permanganate impregnated alumina. So it does have very, very broad acting um, appeal, especially for inorganics. Hydrogen sulfide is very good for this. Sulfur, sulfur dioxide, lots of really good um, and, and hy uh, hydrogen sulfide, um, uh, I think I mentioned already. So lots of good, not every gas at all. And this certainly doesn't have the capacity for hydrogen sulfide that a catalytic product does. Uh, but keep in mind the catalytic product is really just focused on hydrogen sulfide where this is a great broad acting product. So keep that in mind. It's also one key is it's non-combustible. So keep one, one, one factor to keep in mind with activated carbon is activated carbon is made from charcoal. So there is the possibility, though very not, not it's fairly remote of the activated carbon uh, combusting. Uh, this product is it's made from aluminum, basically, uh, aluminum oxide. So it is, it is um, uh, not at all combustible. You could put a torch onto this and it would, and it would, uh, it would never burn. The interesting part of this is there's actually a color change that occurs. So you can see a little bit of color here change on, on these. This is fresh adsorbent media. This is some adsorbent media that's been exposed to a little bit of, of um, gas to be removed. And that's actually what will end up happening is that adsorbent media will turn brown. Uh, and so you can actually use this product in, uh, to, as a, um, a way of knowing whether your adsorbent system has any remaining life or needs to be changed out by taking a sample of this adsorbent media. You can break open one of these pellets and see if there's any purple on the inside. If there is, then you've got adsorbent media um, life remaining because those gases go all the way into the inside of these um, spheres. Keep in mind that you can also blend products as well. So you can see this is a blend of activated carbon and uh, permanganate and pregnant alumina. So this is really a great product for kind of overall capture. So the, so the activated carbon captures some gases, the permanganate and pregnated alumina capture some gases. Some, of they, some gases are captured by both of them, but the good news on this is it has a broad range <laughs> removal of lots of different gases. So if you don't know exactly what odor or what gas you have to remove, selecting a product, a mixed product like this uh, is typically a good option just to be able to throw something at it to be able to capture it here. Uh, so it's very broad acting. It's going to capture 99% of, of odors and, and, and similar gases. It's fire resistant. I should have mentioned to you, this permanganate impregnated alumina, well, maybe I did mention it to it, but it is fire resistant. When it's mixed with the activated carbon, the product becomes fire resistant as well. So it has, that's a very interesting property that it has is that um, uh, it will, um, uh, it, it takes on the fire resistance property of the permanganate impregnated alumina. Uh, there's also a low uh, chance of off-gassing because this doesn't off-gas, so any gases that do go into the activated carbon and maybe do off-gas get caught with a permanganate impregnated alumina, and you still get that color change. So that's a really nice option to be able to work with. All right, we're going to talk about one of the last areas of adsorbents or chemisorbents is scavengers. So a scavenger, this is a, a product which is in the scavenger uh, market. Um, and they focus primarily on just one gas, and it's typically hydrogen sulfide because hydrogen sulfide is a primary gas to remove. These scavengers are not as efficient at removal of hydrogen sulfide. Um, so while the catalytic product that we saw back there uh, a, a few slides back might be 99.9% um, uh, uh, removed might give you 99% removal efficiency. The scavenger product is going to give you a lower efficiency, but the good news about it is that it's a much lower in cost than the catalytic type products. And so this product is very effective at reducing high levels of hydrogen sulfide 
and leaving remaining odor for engineered adsorbents. So typically you could have a two or maybe even three step uh, system where if you had very high levels of odor control, let's say 50 parts per million, you could use the scavenger to reduce that to five parts per million, and then you could send the remaining five parts per million into an engineered adsorbent or a catalytic product uh, to get that you know, to zero parts per million coming out of the system. So this is basically, a, this product here is an iron oxide clay. Um, so it, it's a fairly low cost product. It's a great way to reduce hydrogen sulfide, very cost effective way. And typically the way that this would be applied, this would be in a separate system and you would use this and, and, uh, until it's consumed and then you would change out this adsorbent media and the, the gases coming out of this while it's in operation would go into a secondary system, which would be used for capturing all of the other odors that didn't capture here. So an interesting um, addition to your, um, uh, to your tool bag uh, when you're talking about odor control. All right, when it comes to carbon adsorption system, this is kind of a typical application that you would see. They're simple. Uh, when I uh, carbon or, or it, it engineered adsorbent systems are typically very simple. That's really the attraction to these systems. So there's four uh, main parts to these systems. There is um, an inlet mist filter. I'll mention to you, not every manufacturer specifies an inlet mist filter, but it is really, really important because in the wastewater environment, the, the water droplets that could be in the air and the dirt and the greasy things that are, that are in the air in a wastewater environment are very harmful to activated carbon and other adsorbents. Um, so it's very important that there is some type of a pre-filter which is very effective at removing mist and grease from the system. So it's very important. The very first step is to take out mist and grease from the air. From the air. This needs to be very efficient. Then there's a blower afterwards. That mist and grease filter helps prevent all that grease from getting caught up in the blower as well. It's very important. Then the blower blows air into the adsorbent system. This is a typical, uh, what we would saw, call kind of a, a uh, standard vertical flow system where the adsorbent media is held in an elevated bed. The air is blown into the bottom of the system where it percolates up through the adsorbent media and then comes out the outlet here. So four simple system parts of the system, only one moving part, which is the blower. Um, so there's not a great deal of maintenance required for these type systems. So it can also provide much smaller systems too. That's the nice advantage of adsorbent systems. There's larger systems like this, but you can also have very small systems too. Uh, and so if you stood somebody up next to one of, uh, you know, a person might be about this tall to these, are, uh, to these uh, systems. So, so the advantage, if you have a very small uh, uh, station to work with, then an adsorbent system is an excellent technology to work with um, for a low airflow application. So typically very affordable, slow, uh, low uh, airflow applications. Maybe, um, a uh, hundred to a thousand CFM. These are very, very easy to apply. Um, that would be uh, up to about 1,500 uh, uh, CMH. There's also horizontal flow systems. So these systems have a horizontal flow to them. The adsorbent media is held um, in between perforated screens. Typically, these systems can have multiple beds of adsorbent. So the previous system uh, shown can also have multiple adsorbents, but they would be layered on top of each other. So you might put one adsorbent in the bottom and a second adsorbent on top. The first adsorbent would capture hydrogen sulfide, and the, the second adsorbent would be um, for capturing those other odors. In this type of uh, installation, you might put your hydrogen sulfide odor capture adsorbent here, that catalytic product, and then you could put a broad acting um, uh, reduced sulfur compound adsorbent in this, in this compartment. And that way you can change them out independently. So if this adsorbent media was consumed before this adsorbent media was, then you could 
uh, empty just this compartment and replace that part. Inside here is a, a blower. Uh, so that's a horizontal flow system. So I mentioned to you the mist and grease filter. Just want to stress to you here, here's a, a, a great view in a mist and grease filter. You can see that these are very, very fine fibered filters. This is 316 stainless steel is typically the material that's used for this. And then some poly fibers. So the stainless steel is used for capturing water droplets. Uh, and the, and the uh, fine uh, particle here is used for capturing the grease. And um, uh, these are permanent and, and, and washable. Uh, can't stress enough to you about having um, a, a really, really high efficiency mist and grease filter. Um, it really improves the performance of the system uh, of an engineered adsorbent system. Uh, here's another view of those uh, adsorbent media using multiple adsorbent media beds. So this would be a, a horizontal flow system. So one adsorbent could be here and a second one here. In this application, you've got one adsorbent. This is probably that catalytic high capacity hydrogen sulfide product. And here's your permanganate impregnated alumina. So this is just a top down view um, with the hatch removed of the system. So you can see that. Also mentioned to you in engineered adsorbents, it's possible to use a device to measure the consumption of the adsorbent media as well. So that's referred to as a real-time media bed monitor. This is kind of a dipstick like the oil for your car. So I wanted to point that out to you that there are ways to be able to monitor your odor control system, your adsorbent system. Uh, there are also electronic methods of doing that as well. So this is this device is very similar to this dipstick type device here that I was mentioning to you, except it has an array of sensors on there and it measures the consumption of the adsorbent media. It uses a PLC to track all that information and to actually predict out when the adsorbent media is going to be used. So this has a predictive uh, uh, nature to it where it can actually uh, indicate to you that the remaining life of the adsorbent media is say 13 months away and then uh, next month it would tell you it's 12 months away and that would just constantly adjust depending on the consumption of the adsorbent media. All right, so we've spent a lot of time on adsorbents. So let's we'll talk about other technologies. Um, biological systems. Um, uh, Pure Air also uh, provides biological systems. There's a number of companies out there that provide biological systems. Um, and the key here is that I want to try to clarify some terminology in this system, uh, in, in, this, in this technology. So one of the first types of biological odor control system was referred to as a biofilter. All right, and, and the general description of a biofilter now is um, that it is using some type of um, uh, organic mass of some sort to grow uh, bacteria that eats odors. So a system like this is actually using wood bark and it's blowing air into the bottom uh, section of, the, uh, of it and the air is percolating back up through this wood bark. Uh, when you first activate the system, there isn't really much bacteria in the system and the odor uh, is used as food for the bacteria. Uh, and so as the, this food is blown into the, um, and percolated up through this wood bark, um, the bacteria will begin to grow and expand and they will multiply to the point where they are suddenly, you know, at, at some point in time, usually it takes a few weeks, um, will be able to consume a, a large amount, uh, a large percentage of the odor that comes into the system. So these are generally considered to be a, a fairly green technology. Um, they're generally considered to be a fairly stable technology. I'll mention to you though that these, these bacteria have to be fed um, they, they do live on this, um, these substrates, in this case, a wood mulch. So they do use that to get their minerals and such. They use the odor as food, but they also have to have water. And so very often there are spray systems. In fact, you can probably see these right here. These are spray systems on the system, which are, which are uh, wetting down 
the, uh, the wood bark to make sure that it stays wet, all right? So if you're in a hot, dry environment and uh, water is a resource which is limited, uh, this technology doesn't work, work really well. Also, if you're in a really, really wet, rainy environment, you have to be careful that you don't provide it too much water as well too. So it might actually be required that you have to cover the, the systems to prevent them from being overloaded with rain. And so, um, and also if you're in a cold environment or extremely hot environment, you have to be careful because the bacteria grow within a certain temperature range. And so uh, winter time in a subarctic area, these systems may not function very well. Uh, and certainly in uh, very hot areas like the Middle East, you'd, you'd have to worry about overheating the systems um, uh, as well. So that's a concern for biofilters. The technology for, for biofilters has evolved um, uh, to, let's call it a more engineered system. So this is an example of a bio uh, scrubber. Um, this is a large, typically fiberglass or um, HDPE vessel. And inside of it has an engineered packing um, and a recirculation, typically a recirculation loop, which is um, feeding bacteria which grow onto the packing. So air is brought into the bottom of the system uh, and it's percolated up through an engineered packing where bacteria is growing. And so this is really just a biological reactor. Um, this te technology is referred to as bioscrubbing or biotrickling filter. Um, biotrickling filter is also name of a technology that's used in the actual wastewater process. So we typically try to stay away from the term biotrickling filter and try to use the term bioscrubber because it appears to, it, it seems to be a little more descriptive rather than biotrickling filter that where it can be confused with the process, the wastewater treatment process. So this is a bio scrubber. I think I've got another slide here that's showing kind of the difference between the technology. So a biofilter takes a blower. It typically runs it through a humidifier because you wanna be able to run good moist air up through here. I, the, and you may have to have uh, uh, those misting systems uh, to be able to keep the, the uh, the filter media wet. Uh, this um, that air is basically just blown up and percolated through the biomass. Periodically, this biomass will have to be removed because the bacteria will consume and break down the filter media. So in this this case, we had seen this kind of wood mulch in the previous um, in the previous uh, view. I think coconut husks are often used in that for that as well. Uh, but that periodically breaks down uh, and has to be removed and then uh, new uh, filter media would be put in and you would go through the process of growing that uh, bacteria again and bringing the system back up. Um, generally, rule of thumb might be every three years or so, you might have to change out the filter media to, depending on, on how the system operates and how much odor has been going in, how much bacteria works. So the bio scrubber or the, or the bio trickling filter works in a little different way, but generally a similar manner. Waste gas is brought up, it's percolated up through a packing column. This packing column, there's lots of different options for packing column, but the bottom line here is this packing column provides the surface area for the bacteria to grow. That bacteria grows on the surface of all this packing column. And then there is a recirculation loop Typically, it's a recirculation loop, which is taking the uh, water, which is sprayed onto the bacteria, and it is uh, uh, adding some nutrient to it. So a little nutrient is put in uh, to provide the bacteria with, with the minerals that they need to grow, uh, the nutrients. And, and then there will be some waste which comes out. Typically, this is very acidic, thus bacteria that grows in here is typically an acidophilus bacteria that likes acid, it eats acid, especially for hydrogen sulfide. And so um, that uh, waste, which is coming out of the bioscrubber will be typically highly acidic. And that, that's one concern that you need to be aware of. Um, that you're gonna be bringing fresh water into the system and some nutrient in the system. It's going to be bringing uh, odors, especially hydrogen sulfide into the system and then it, you're going to be getting an acidic water coming out. So that 
you, you may need to consider that where that's going to be discharged to. <clears throat> so one of the keys that I want to mention to you in regard to biofilters and biosrubbers is they're typically good a biofilter can be very good about removing lots of different types of odors because in this case, different types of bacteria can grow at different levels within the biomass. So you, at the very bottom level, you may have an acidophilus uh, bacteria that might capture your hydrogen sulfide. And then farther up where it's not as acidic, you'd have other bacteria that might capture other types of odors here. So. Generally, a biofilter is pretty good. It's, it's very good at taking out hydrogen sulfide, but it's also pretty good at taking out some other odors. Um, the the bioscrubber is typically tailored to focus on removal of one particular odor, and that is typically hydrogen sulfide. So this is typically um, hydrogen sulfide removal. It's typically used in applications where you have very, very high H2S typically above 50 parts per million hydrogen sulfide. I want to note to you that this hydrogen sulfide is used as, an, as, a, as a food for the bacteria. So if you have an interruption or if you don't have enough hydrogen sulfide coming into your system, the system won't function very well because you're not giving it enough food. So be, keep, be, keep that in mind that this is a basically living organism and it requires food. And you can't just shut it off for a period of time and expect to turn it back on and it continue to work well. So when we um, are taking a look at uh, biofilters and bioscrubbers, here's some, here's some general attributes of these. So a biofilter is it's typically a fairly simple device. It's a box filled with some type of organic mulch and a blower um, and a humidification system of some way to keep it in there. It's typically low cost uh, to build um, compared to other technologies. Um, it, it's typically low in maintenance. There's not a great deal of maintenance required for it. And it provides generally pretty good broad odor removal. It's typically optimal for lower odor levels. So if you have really high hydrogen sulfide levels, a biofilter is not typically going to be a great product for removing high levels of hydrogen sulfide. From a design standpoint, a typical number which is used in the sizing of a biofilter is to allow about 30 seconds of residence time. So that can be quite a bit and that really increases, it means that for every unit of airflow, you have a fairly large system. And so these systems typically take up a lot of area. Uh, we see them mainly used in more rural areas and, and not very heavily in uh, urban areas, uh, unless it's for a fairly low airflow. So a bio scrubber, or what we refer to as a bio, it can be referred to as a bio trickling filter. It's typically hydrogen sulfide focused. It's not easy for these bio scrubbers to handle all odors. Um, there are recirculation systems which are hydrogen sulfide focused. There are some once through systems. That means that you're continuously filling it, uh, spraying water and that water is drained immediately. Um, uh, those typically can focus on other odors, but then they have less capacity for hydrogen sulfide. So there's a trade off there. Um, uh, they're certainly more complex. There's pumps and sensors. You've got to monitor pH and uh, lots of uh, levels to watch out for and nutrient feed. So it's certainly a more of an engineered system. Uh, in cold climates, you need to worry about freeze protection. This is going to have lots of water lines uh, and pumps and such. So uh, if you're in a cold area of the world, that's a big issue to, to deal with. You don't want your bio filter freezing up in the wintertime. Um, it's very well suited for high H2S levels. So these systems are typically seen anywhere from even as low as 20 parts per million of hydrogen sulfide to often 300 parts per million and sometimes into the thousands of parts per million of hydrogen sulfide. A typical number which is used 
for residence time when sizing these systems is 15 seconds. Um, uh, typically don't need more than that. And some technologies, especially if you have really, really high surface areas for your packing inside your system can be less than 15 seconds, significantly less than 15 seconds. This residence time is going to be heavily dependent on the manufacturer and the, and the surface area they use. Uh, and it's also dependent on hydrogen sulfide, more right, uh, the, the hydrogen sulfide level. If you have a really high hydrogen sulfide level and you want a really high efficiency to remove it, you're going to need more residence time because you're going to need more surface area, more bacterial load inside the system. So that's a bio scrubber, bio trickling filter features and such. So we're just going to throw up a slide about chemical scrubbing. I mentioned to you, we're not going to talk a lot about it, but chemical scrubbing is similar to biological, or actually, I guess I would say the bio, the bio scrubber is very similar to chemical scrubbing. Um, in that it's a tower with a packing and there's a chemical typically recirculation going on. But you can see all the features of a chemical scrubber. They're fairly complex. They're certainly very much engineered systems. There are certainly uh, great applications and great uses for chemical scrubbing, um, but generally they're using very um, ha hazardous chemicals. Um, and uh, you, the maintenance required of these systems is significant. Um, so, and also the chemical usage can be significant. Um, I'll mention to you as well, a chemical scrubber, need, you need to understand your maximum uh, gas removal needed. So for hydrogen sulfide, if you've got flux, flux, a fluctuating hydrogen sulfide, the system needs to be designed based on the maximum hydrogen sulfide. Some of the other technologies just are concerned with average odor, odor level where you need to worry about maximum level here. But typically the system uh, will very often have the smallest footprint. Uh, this graph here is a fairly complex system, uh, obviously. Um, uh, typically we don't see them being that complex, uh, but uh, this is typically a, a chemical scrubber. So five slides to go in our presentation today. Um, so uh, taking a look at chemical scrubbing for odor control, typically a chemical scrubber focuses on one gas. We've seen some systems out there that have multiple stages for chemical scrubbing, where it's basically three, two to three different stages of chemical, different chemicals which are used. Uh, the concern there is that one chemical can very often get carried over into the next chemical, which gets carried into the next one. So. Uh, rather than having three separate chemical scrubbers, they're combined. Um, we've heard mixed reactions about these combined uh, chemical. Uh, so typically the, the technologies, it, it certainly works very well for one gas, let's just say that, as opposed to removing multiple gases. Um, these systems do contain high concentrations of reactive hazardous liquids, so you need to be make sure that your you're able to work with all those hazards and store them. Typically, even the storage requires special uh, handling uh, in case there's some type of a spill. Maintenance requirements are significant, must be designed for maximum gas levels, but generally has the lowest overall footprint per unit of airflow. So taking a look at the different technologies, we kind of summarize the, the different technologies in this way. <clears throat> activated carbon, just plain activated carbon, um, generally has very low maintenance and fairly high efficiencies. You're, you're typically talking about 99% plus uh, removal efficiencies with activated carbon. Um, it does require some periodic re replacement and generally plain activated carbon has a fairly low hydrogen sulfide capacity. But if we move to engineered adsorbents, they, you typically have the lower uh, a low maintenance like activated carbon, the same high efficiencies, and you can have lots of different configurations for be using different uh, types of engineered adsorbents. I showed you some of those. It does require that periodic replacement. So customers need to understand that every 18 to 24 months, they're gonna have to replace the adsorbent in the system, just depending on the amount of odor that the system has captured. Uh, biofilter. 
There's no hazardous chemicals. That's very nice about a biofilter. You're pretty much just spraying it with some water, very low maintenance. Uh, the disadvantage is a, a fairly large footprint. Uh, also, it doesn't handle, typically doesn't handle high levels of odor. Um, a bio scrubber, again, we don't have any hazardous chemicals, except I will mention it's generating a hazardous chemical. So typically the drain water as mentioned is very acidic. So you need to be concerned about that hazardous chemical that it's generating. Um, it's very effective at high H2S levels. Um, uh, various customers will quote high H2S levels and we certainly know that a bio scrubber can be 99% effective at removal of H2S. Um, I will mention a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, the technology is typically considered to be a green technology, right? Because you're not adding chemicals uh, necessarily to it. We're using bacteria to capture odor. So the perception is that it's a green technology. Um, there is a significant maintenance to these systems. So um, th there are lots of um, uh, issues that need to be made, uh, monitored as far as uh, flows and pHs and such. And so it's important to keep up with the maintenance of these systems. They certainly don't have the maintenance required of a chemical scrubber, uh, but it is an engineered system uh, and it does need to be monitored. There is significant water consumption here. So basically the, the more H2S there is, the more water you're gonna have to consume. Uh, thousands of gallons a day, typically of water, which is gonna be used. So if you're in an area where water is scarce, uh, keep that in mind when you're selecting this, this um, as well. Uh, I mentioned the discharge of the acidic water, that's important. The reality as well is that while a bio scrubber when operated by a manufacturer or somebody who uh, is really focusing on keeping the system running really well, can run at 99%. I think the real world efficiency that we see out there, that when the typical, when it gets in use and it gets turned over to the end client is more like 95% efficiency. Um, uh, without a doubt, with, with factory attention and with expert attention, they'll, they'll provide 99% efficiency. But we typically, in reality, um, see that they operate around more like 95% efficiency. Um, chemical scrubbers have a low footprint. Uh, lots of vendors of, of uh, chemical scrubbers, you can go online and pretty much design um, a, a wet scrubber. Uh, there are some companies that sell the packing inside of these wet scrubbers and, and you can use their software to uh, put in your exact chemical and concentration and they will tell you exactly the design of the system that you need. So typically these initial costs are fairly low on, uh, on chemical scrubbers, but there are significant maintenance costs. And of course you're dealing with hazardous chemicals too. So um, odor control technology. So here's some other information that you can use when trying to make decisions about what technology to use. So uh, we're gonna take a look at use of chemicals, footprint, complexity, efficiency, multiple odor removal, capital costs and operating costs. We'll go through this fairly quickly. Activated carbon doesn't have any chemicals that needs to get added to it as a kind of medium footprint per unit of airflow. Low complexity, there's just really one moving part, which is the fan. Um, efficiency is typically 99% or greater. We, we very often seen even 99.9% .9 or more. Um, multiple odor removal, yes. And activated carbon can capture lots of different types of odors. Capital cost is generally low and operating cost is, is generally low for engineering adsorbents, no chemicals, same kind of footprint in complexity, same kind of efficiencies, definitely multiple odor removal. Capital costs are typically gonna be higher because the engineered adsorbent is more expensive than activated carbon. And the operating cost is gonna be a little higher than activated carbon because they're replacement costs. But this is going to capture more uh, odor removal. It's gonna be, uh, I guess when you're comparing the two, activated carbon and engineered adsorbent, you're gonna get longer life. So you're gonna to have to change over. You're gonna be able to work in applications that have higher H2S levels 
uh, as compared to activated carbon. A biofilter, no chemicals. It has a very large footprint, uh, low complexity, efficiencies probably 90% or so with a biofilter. Uh, multiple odor removal does occur uh, in a biofilter, medium capital costs, could be low capital costs even, uh, and operating costs are typically low. Uh, bio scrubber, we do have to add nutrients, but it's typically a non-hazardous product, which is added to the bio scrubber, medium footprint, medium complexity, 95 plus percent efficiency. I think, uh, you know, operating at, at full speed, it's 90, I mean, you know, on, on, with really good attention, it's 99%, but as mentioned, I think in real life, we're seeing, most clients will see 95%. Odor, tip, multiple odor removal, typically not in a bio scrubber. You're typically focusing on hydrogen sulfide. Capital costs are typically very high, but you're using these bio scrubbers for capturing high levels of hydrogen sulfide. And so typically they can be most cost effective, even though the capital cost is high. Uh, and the operating cost is, is typically uh, medium, just depending on what area of the world and how much time that you're uh, using to keep up with the system. Chemical scrubbers, yes. So you've got lots of chemicals, caustics and bleaches and acids, uh, just depending on what uh, odor you're removing. Footprint is generally small, complexity is very high, efficiencies can be very good. Um, multiple odor removal, typically not. I did mention the multiple stage systems. There, those have been mixed uh, success. Um, capital costs are generally low per unit of airflow and operating costs are actually can be very high because of all the chemical consumption. So uh, concluding uh, our um, total odor control is possible. Selection of technology requires knowledge or assumption. One focus I want to mention to you, but we didn't, because we, we're comparing different technologies, is considered hybrid technologies. So, for instance, we did talk about the scavenger followed by adsorbent, engineered adsorbent. So you can use the scavenger to remove a high percentage of your hydrogen sulfide and then use an engineered adsorbent. Um, to capture the remaining odor, or a bio scrubber followed by engineering adsorbent. That's a really great um, way to capture most of your hydrogen sulfide, but then have an engineered adsorbent uh, system as a backup in case there's an upset with your bio scrubber and to capture those remaining levels of odors. Because if you have, let's even say 300 parts per million of hydrogen sulfide, if you have 99% removal, you're still gonna have three parts per million of hydrogen sulfide. So that engineered adsorbent would be very helpful afterwards to take that, that three uh, parts per million out of the system. So we're gonna move into q and I see there's been some questions that have been coming in while I've been talking. Um, I haven't had a chance to look at those, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and back up and take a look at some of these and see what we can um what questions we can we can add here so let's see um so adrian uh has asked a question what is the major consideration in an odor control sizing um and so uh and adrian if you wanted to follow up with an email we can work with you on some details on that but sizing is is basically Airflow and hydrogen sulfide level is the two, or, or let's say your odor level, typically that's hydrogen sulfide. So those are the two factors that are used in sizing the system. So the higher your airflow and the higher your odor level, that's typically the larger the system that you're going to need. And that's pretty much across the board for all the technologies. Um, so you said, uh, uh, is it based on target odor limits, the discharge, or more on the inlet quality of the air? Well, it's actually both, definitely on the inlet quality, but the sizing typically affects the efficiency on it too. So you have to take a look at your inlet, um, and then you have to take a look at your desired outlet. Uh, if you have really, really low discharge limits, then you're going to really probably going to have to size your system up in order to have um, some high efficiencies in the system. Um, the, um, uh, you're also going to need to consider the technology you're looking at when sizing it too. So keep in mind, for instance, 
um, a, uh, a bio scrubber or a wet scrubber, you need to really consider what your maximum uh, H2S level is gonna be and you need to design the system to handle that maximum. Whereas in an activated carbon system or a uh, engineered adsorbent system, typically you're focused on average odor level rather than maximum odor level. You also ask, how, how does the uncertainties in the actual odor generation of a future facility would affect the performance of the odor control system during actual operation? Well, that's a big factor and something that we have to work with clients all the time on is we always have to make an assumption about what the odor level is going to be. Um, what, we, what we typically find is that uh, the assumption is usually much higher than what happens in real life. Okay, so one, one factor I wanna to mention to you is if you have an existing system and somebody goes out there and, and measures the odor level in an existing, let's call it a lift station, but that lift station doesn't have any ventilation, when you measure that odor level, you're gonna get what's kind of the stagnant uh, odor level of the system. So that stagnant odor level is what we refer to as the static odor level. When you turn on an odor control system, it's going to draw odor out, but it's gonna draw fresh air into that, that same space and it's gonna dilute that odor. So keep in mind that <coughs> the static level of odor in a station is much, much higher than what we refer to as the dynamic or the ventilated air level coming into the odor control system. So we see a lot of errors that are made when designing an odor control system of oversizing the system because maybe an engineer uh, has gone in and measured the odor level at a station and he determined that it was 100 parts per million but that's the static level and those odors have been allowed to build up over a period of time. When you connect the odor control system, it brings in that fresh air, it pulls out the odor, and the reality is typically we see about a tenfold reduction in the odor level. So if you had 100 in a static, then we might see 10 in a dynamic uh, or ventilated situation. So that's a big factor that we see and typically People are very concerned uh, about undersizing a system. And, and of course, undersizing a system is a big problem. But I'll mention that oversizing a system can also be a big problem, especially when it comes to biological systems. If you oversize a biological system, you might not have enough food to feed the biology that's there. We've seen that a number of times where a customer has put in a biological system and they only had one part per million coming in of hydrogen sulfide, and there wasn't enough food to keep the bacteria alive, and the bacteria uh, just simply wouldn't function very well. So I appreciate that question, Adrian. And um, you know, there you can see our email address to our general email box there. If you have any further questions, please do uh, send us a note. We'd be more than happy to uh, provide some uh, additional information as well. Uh, oh, looks like there's another question from Adrian as well, too. Can you share a guide on the proper selection of type of odor control? So we can, we're gonna be doing uh, some further info, uh, webinars on specific sizing for specific technologies, um, or at least the ones that we're experts in. Uh, we'll do that at a future date, but if you have something ongoing now, we'll be more than happy to share that with you. We do have some sizing information that we can send to you or anyone that's interested in it. We do have um, some information on sizing that we can send to you. So just send us a note um, or talk to your local contact for Pure Air and we'll be happy to send some information to you there. Um, uh, so we have a question from Hassan Chamas uh, in the UAE and uh, he says some studies showed bacterial contamination in air at kilometers away from a biofilter or a bi biological filter installations. Um, this calls for second stage filtration that can remove bacteria from the exhaust air by particulate filters. Um, does the beast uh, have a well particulate uh, filter at the exhaust? So the, so the answer is yes. So our system that we sell is referred to as the beast. It stands for the Biological Engineered Adsorbent scrubber technology. So the BEAST actually has 
a biological system followed by an adsorbent system. We think that's a really great use of the two technologies together in a hybrid system. So you use a biological system which captures the hydrogen sulfide and really reduces that in a very cost-effective manner. Uh, typically, this beast solution would be used in applications of 50 or higher ppm of hydrogen sulfide plus other odors. So the beast will reduce that 5 ppm to the PPB level, but you still could potentially have some odor level uh, at that point. So it then exhausts the air through a uh, high efficiency filter, and then it filters the air um, in or sends the air in through an adsorbent system, which will probably typically will have that uh, catalytic um, adsorbent uh, and the broad range adsorbent removal. And so you're getting uh, very, very, very high efficiencies. The other uh, point to mention, I, I mentioned this earlier, is that engineered adsorbent system after the biological system is important. If you have an upset in your biological system, if somehow something gets off, a nutrient doesn't get fed properly, or uh, there's some type of other condition which harms the, the um, biological mass, then the uh, adsorbent system acts as a temporary boost for uh, capturing those level, those higher levels of odors until the biological system could come back online at full strength. All right. Um, doesn't look like we have other questions, I don't believe. Let's see if anybody has their hand raised. I don't think so. So um, if you've got any other questions, throw one at me real quickly. Otherwise, we are going to plan on closing this. Um, I do want to um, uh, thank all of Pure Air's local representatives, um, and especially uh, our representative, uh, Amagtech uh, in Jordan and the UAE, for prompting us to provide this webinar, especially uh, on your time zone. It was early in the morning for us here, um, but I think it's really great for us to be able to do this webinar uh, for uh, all of you in this area of the country. Oh, looks like we do have some new messages. Let's see. Um, uh, have a, a question about, would be great if we could expand on the issues of varying odor levels and how this affects biological filters. Would would uh, dilution at an inlet by fresh air allow the system to cope better with varying hydrogen sulfide levels? No, I don't, I don't think that dilution would necessarily affect that, but I can tell you that varying levels do. There's, you know, lots of different, um, um, uh, there have been lots of different, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, there, there, there are lots of different issues with various levels of, of odor. You've got diurnal issues where, and you've got seasonal issues, and that definitely affects biological. I, just keep this in mind. It's like food. Um, so just like when you're eating food, um, you can either eat too little or eat too much, and that has a negative effect on you. So um, hydrogen sulfide on a biological system has the same effect. Of course, they would, the biological system would love it if you were fed a very even amount of food uh, all the time. But if you go through a period of time where you don't have enough food coming, then the biological mass, part of it will die or uh, will be hindered by it. Or if you have too much odor coming through, it will be overwhelmed by it. And so that's certainly another good reason to have an adsorbent system after your biological system is so that if your biological is overwhelmed, then you'll be able to uh, have an adsorbent system to capture, capture it. Um, so it looks like Sakun had uh, a question that I missed earlier. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, let me go back up to the top. I, I apologize for not seeing your question prior. Um, Let's see, actually, I don't see your question. Uh, would, you mind, would you mind posting that again for us so that we can, we can ask? The, the other is I can always, um, uh, uh, turn on your speaker as well if you'd like to ask your question.
uh, let's see, Hitesh has asked if we can send the, the, the presentation. We are recording the presentation uh, and we will have that available on a YouTube channel. So once we have that YouTube posted, we're gonna send that to you so you'll be able to watch it on YouTube. Um, hey, Kevin. Uh, yes, hi, Sakun. Uh, this is Ashlyn. Oh, I'm sorry, Ashlyn, yes. Can I read you the questions from the Q&A? Yes, thank you very much. I guess I don't have the Q&A up. Please do. Okay, so Hoon asks, good to hear about the new device referring to the Acrolog. Um, how does it compare to the Odalog in terms of price and performance? Yeah, so, so the price is similar. I think it might even be a little less than the Odalog. Now, uh, yeah, well, I see all the questions now. Uh, so um, thanks for bringing that to my attention. So for the, for the Acrolog, uh, the price is similar. I think the price is, I don't know, it's about $1,800 base price for the unit, I think. Um, but then there's lots of different options you can add. There's also some additional models. There's a part per million model, a part per billion model, uh, and so there's lots of different ones to work with. But in general, they're, they're considered reasonably priced devices, uh, and the nice thing is the options, like the, like the wireless option. Of course, you're going to have to pay more for the, uh, for the wireless option, um, but that's a really nice because um, we've had many times where we'll send a, uh, a log out to somebody to work with, um, and we don't get that information until they send it back to us and we download the data. And if they didn't turn the system on properly or they didn't uh, put it in the right location, it comes back without any data or without any good data on there. So that wireless feature is, is nice, uh, cellular uh, feature is nice to have so that um, you can monitor it and know that you're getting good data uh, there as well. So uh, I appreciate that. Um, uh, another question from Sakun uh, is, how does scavenger media compare with high capacity media like uh, uh, specifically Midas? So the scavenger media actually has the same capacity in terms of grams per cc. Really good question. Um, it, it's typically the 0.3 grams per cc <coughs> um, of adsorbent media. Now the scavenger media weighs more. And so you're get, typically going to have a lower capacity by weight. It typically weighs about twice as much because it has all that iron in there. Um, but by volume, it has about the same capacity. But again, it doesn't have the same efficiency. Uh, you're not going to typically see that 99.9% .9 efficiency like a really good um, high capacity uh, catalytic product uh, would like the Midas product or like our Shelf Absorb XL product, but the cost is far less. The scavenger media is about half the price or maybe even less than half the price of those high capacity products. And so it really makes a lot of sense in those applications where you have high H2S load uh, to have a scavenger media in there that you change out more often and then just leave the residual odors left over there too. Um, we have another question. We have two plants which are sulfuric acid plants and phosphoric acid plants on the same campus. We're facing corrosion problems for electronic hardwares, which adsorbents or products are best suitable for you. Yeah, so that's a different issue. Rather than odor control, this is actually control of gases, in this case, acid gases. So in, the, in this case, we would typically use um, our uh, sulfazorb or carbazorb product to capture these acid gases, um, and uh, we would we can work with you on that to the uh, uh, to capture those gases in the right way and protect those electronic hardware. Uh, we can help you with that. Um, uh, it's very important that that's done right because if uh, if you just concentrate on removing the gases, you can create some other problems for temperature and humidity where your electronics are stored. Um, we actually have another video about protecting electronics on our YouTube uh, available. So we'll try to remember to send to you a link to that YouTube where you can understand the process of removing acid gases or corrosive gases from the air. It's very similar technology, but the application is just a little bit different as well, too. Um, uh, Sakun mentions that WEF, WEF MOP25 further defines biotrickling filter and bioscrubber differently. Bioscrubber 
with an AS tank, but value trifling does not. Yeah, and so, you know, we certainly reflect that, that WEF gives these definitions, but out in the market, that's what we're, we're typically seeing is a lot of confusion between the ter terminologies, different manufacturers are using different technology. So that's why we try to use them somewhat interchangeably. Um, uh, and we just want to point that out. But thank you very much, Sakun, for mentioning that to us. Lifetime of the carbon. Um, Rashid has asked about lifetime of carbon or lifetime of absorbent media. So that can fairly well be calculated. Um, if we can know the level of odor uh, and the airflow, we can actually calculate, typically what we do is we calculate a total annual load of the odor to be removed. So in hydrogen sulfide, we typically can take um, our PPM and our airflow, and we can just go through a formula that calculates the total amount of hydrogen sulfide that would be removed in the year if we just focus on hydrogen sulfide. And then based on that, we take a look at the amount of uh, the adsorbent that we have and its capacity. And we take, and, and based on that, we can take a look at uh, how much capacity it has. So for instance, uh, a catalytic um, engineered adsorbent that has 67% by weight, if we have a, had a thousand kilos of that, then it could capture 670 kilos of hydrogen sulfide. If we go through and we calculate that we have 600 kilos of hydrogen sulfide that are going to have to be captured, then we know that the adsorbent media is gonna last over just a little over a year or so. Um, if you wanna go through that formula, send us a note. We'll be happy to work with you on that. You can send us some numbers. We can send you that formula. It's nothing real secretive about the formula for sure. It's basically just calculating the mass of the um, amount of odor to be removed. So uh, it's fairly simple to do. Um, let's see, can you tell us about residence time and air velocity selection? So uh, thanks, Amol, for your question. So yeah, residence time, um, typically uh, carbon or engineered uh, adsorbent systems, you're, you can typically work very well with less than three seconds of residence time. Uh, even less than two, two seconds of residence time work fairly well inside an adsorbent system. Um, we mentioned the biofilters might need 30 seconds, the bio scrubbers, maybe 15 seconds is a good rule of thumb, even though some technologies allow for having lower residence time uh, in there. I can't tell you about chemical scrubbers. Certainly not a lot of residence time is needed for chemical scrubbers. It would be very low, um, but that's generally about. As far as velocities go, um, I can I uh, I can speak with you. Uh, velocity is not very key for bio scrubbers. That's more about residence time. Um, velocity um, for adsorbent systems is typically anywhere in the um, 50 to 75 feet per minute. Um, um, excuse my my use of in, uh, of uh, of uh, non-metric terms, but 50 to 75 feet per minute. We typically try to stay away from higher than 75 feet per minute unless the uh, odor level is very, very low um, because you'll typically run into um, lower efficiencies that we'd like to avoid with that. So typically 50 to 75 feet per minute for velocities. Um, Let's see, we have an anonymous attendee that's asked a question, in the design that inlet air is yet is not yet available for sewage pump stations, is there a rule of thumb to assumed design odor control systems? So, so there are some guidelines that we can provide to you about it. It depends on uh, what area of the world you're in. Um, certainly uh, when it comes to a pumping station, warm areas of the world uh, typically are going to have higher possibilities of generating higher levels of hydrogen sulfide. It also matters how far, how much dwell time that the sewage has had in uh, the system uh, at that point in time. Um, so a lot of that is due to elevation. Uh, sewage flows downhill uh, typically much faster uh, than uh, in, in uh, an area with some uh, elevation. So typically lowlands have higher levels. So there's not great rules of thumbs, but 
we can give you some general advice if you'd like to send uh, send us a note. I appreciate your your question there. Um, Sakun has got another another uh, uh, question. I'm interested to learn more about biotracking filter technology by, offered by Pure Air. How long has that system been on the market? Is it a once through or a recirculation re system? Does it differ from other suppliers like Bio Airs and others? So, so <clears throat> the 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 beast our bio scrubbing system um it has been on the market for about three years now uh really it's gotten a tremendous amount of attention um in the market because uh there are a number of unique features to it so keep in mind that we are typically uh, offering the system as a combined technology of bio trickling filter or bio scrubber plus absorbent media system they work together and so we can design the system optimally to have really the absolute highest um, air, uh, efficiency. So the, some of the other manufacturers you might be, might be aware of will provide a bio scrubber and then they'll say, then we'll just put a carbon system after that. And they don't know a lot about uh, engineered absorbance. And so we're, we're able to put a very highly tailored system. Our system is also gonna have a tremendous amount of, um, uh, monitoring on it, including our uh, electronic bed monitor on the absorbent media. So you're going to be able to really get some great monitoring from the system. We're, we also have an extremely high surface area. We have our Sulfasorb SI uh, glass foam, um, engineered glass foam, which is used as the basis for um, our absorbent media. Uh, maybe is the basis for our surface area inside of our power tower packing. This has really, really, really high surface area. Surface area is the key to all of these technologies uh, because that reaction occurs on in that surface area. So the higher surface areas allow you to grow uh, more bacteria and, and have a higher efficiency. So that's what it's about. But Sakun, I'll be happy to forward uh, further information to you about the beast. Uh, it's a really nice uh, technology, very, very reliable uh, and highly efficient as well. Uh, another question from Sakun for the BioScrubber Plus AC or engineered adsorbent configuration, how would the engineered adsorbent compete with activated carbon? Well, so activated carbon is really good, as mentioned, for volatile organic compounds. So if you wanted to take out volatile organic compounds, it uh, activated carbon would be really good, but engineered adsorbent is superior otherwise, certainly for taking out um, hydrogen sulfide and reduced sulfur compounds uh, with that. So that's the, the big difference with it. Um, typically our configuration for odor control would be uh, high levels of odor, would it be a bio scrubber, followed by an engineered adsorbent system, which has a two part uh, adsorbent media bed in it. The first would be our Sulfazorb XL that has a high, very, very high capacity for uh, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, so that takes out basically all of the hydrogen sulfide from the system. And then we would follow it with our CPS-12 blend, which has that permanganate impregnated alumina and activated carbon. And that allows uh, for capture of all those remaining odors. So Generally, you won't have any odor coming out of the outlet of the system, even though you might have some extreme levels coming into the bio scrubber. Uh, we've got a point from Rashid. Uh, if you can arrange guidelines on how to conduct proper maintenance for each type and provide troubleshooting for each type, is there any visible operation, operations at site to determine remedial action and results of fault? So this depends on the type of technology, but yeah, we can try to provide some uh, guidance for you in regard to proper maintenance of, of these different ones. So I appreciate that question. We'll, we'll try to follow up with everybody in regard to some of these. Uh, let's see, going, going back to our chat. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Sudhir has a question about what would be your recommendation for pure air for a station that has average concentration of about 150 ppm H2S. So that's definitely an application for our beast. Um, that high level H2S, we would typically put a bio scrubber and followed by our engineered adsorbent system. 
uh, and that provides great reliability and great removal efficiency. We would have far less than one part per million odor level coming out of the system. Typically, uh, you know, typically un unrecordable levels of, of uh, hydrogen sulfide coming out of the system, certainly less than 10 parts per billion coming out of it, even though we would have 150 parts per million going into it. So thanks, Sudhir. Yeah, follow, follow up with us if you'd like some uh, further information on helping to size that system. So Abdul Razak has a pump station, 600 ppm. Customer needs 99.99% uh, removal. Well, that's a challenge. 600 ppm is quite a bit. Definitely would like to work with you, uh, Abdul uh, Razak, on that station. We can certainly do it. it. It is a challenge at 600 parts per million, but I do probably want to work with you on how that was measured. Is that a continuous uh, uh, flow of 600 ppm, or is that that dynamic versus static uh, level that I mentioned? So uh, send us a note, and we'll see what we can do on that. Uh, it would be especially helpful if that was a static level that we can work with uh, on there. Uh, and uh, Razak has followed up with 2,500 CFM. So 2,500 CFM uh, and 120 ppm, just to, just to let everybody know, I'll do the calculation real quickly, but that is a total load each year of, sorry, uh, 2,500, I'm uh, 2,500 times 600. That's 68,000 pounds or 31,000 kilograms of hydrogen sulfide that needs to be removed each year. So it's certainly a challenge. We're up for it, uh, but we'll work with you to fine tune that if you can uh, work on sending us some further information on that result. All right, um, I think that we have come to the end of our questions, uh, both in uh, the questions section and in the chat section. Um, so unless I see something from anybody else, I'll thank you all very much for uh, helping us out. I appreciate all of our uh, Pure Air family, uh, our throughout the world who have promoted this webinar, um, uh, especially uh, AMAGTEC, uh, the team in, in Jordan and the UAE who, who prompted us to, to do this webinar. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, we look forward to future conversations with you and we'll let you know when the next webinar comes around. Thank you very much.